years of experience working with horses, and group two was find an inexperienced handler who did have experience with other large animals, but not with horses. Horses were first tested unblindfolded and then blindfolded so that they could access their own controls and account for any habituation that might have occurred during the test. Each horse was also randomly assigned an exit direction to account for any side preferences or possible associations with where each exit direction led to in the barn. For the test itself, the handler entered the stall, put on the halter and blindfold, and led the horse out of the stall two meters into the barn aisle in either direction. A successful test meant the horse crossed the finish line with all four feet within one minute of haltering or blindfolding. Now, handlers were given no specific instructions on how to handle or lead the horses, but they were not allowed to talk to them, and they were told to move quickly to emulate the pace of an emergency scenario. Now, study two was performed with the 27 horses who were successful in study one. Once again, we assigned groups semi-randomly to account for sex. Group one was led by an experienced handler wearing a fire suit, and group two was led by that same experienced handler wearing regular clothing and a riot helmet. Within the groups, treatment order was randomly assigned with half of the horses attempting the obstacle course blindfolded first and half attempting it unblindfolded first. This was to help us account for horses that might have habituated to the course on their first attempt. The course itself was designed to provide horses with different physical, proprioceptive, auditory, and visual obstacles that would challenge them in different ways depending on if they were blindfolded or not. At obstacle one, horses weaved through a line of columns on the ground. Obstacle two, they were turned around and asked to back up through a short shoot of ground poles. Obstacle three, they walked forward again over a large blue tarp on the ground that made a noise when they stepped on it. At obstacle four, they walked through a gate made of two jump standards with pool noodles reaching inward that would brush the horse's shoulders and flanks as they walked through it. To analyze our heart rate data, we used the heart rate difference from the baseline and normalized our values for analysis. We then performed Glimmix tests with repeated measures for horse, blindfolded treatment, handler experience and exit direction for study one, fire suit and treatment order for study two, and of course our fixed factors of age, sex, height, and breed of all horses. Following those tests, we ran post hoc multiple comparisons using two feet blue square means. Now in study one, as we expected, blindfolds had a significant effect on several variables. On the top left here, you can see that blindfolded horses took nearly three times longer to be led from their stall than unblindfolded horses. On the top right, they required five times more pressure on the lead rope, and their heart rate increase, shown on the bottom left, was approximately two and a half times more than that of unblindfolded horses. In addition to this, blindfolded horses also displayed nearly seven times more active avoidance behaviors while being led than their unblindfolded counterparts. And also, as we expected, handler experience played a significant role in our study one results as well. Our inexperienced handler took twice as long to halter the horse as the experienced handler, and nearly three times as long to blindfold them. Our inexperienced handler also encountered a much higher frequency of active avoidance behaviors in the haltering and blindfolding phases. However, once the horse was haltered and blindfolded, handler experience had very little impact on the actual leading phase of the test. That was mostly just impacted by the blindfolds. Now, in study two, our fire suit didn't have any statistically significant impact on our output. However, the blindfold effect did generate some interesting results for us. Blindfold time per obstacle is on that top left there. Blindfold effect on brain tension is on the top right. And on the bottom, you'll see blindfold effect on frequency of active refusal per obstacle. Now, our first two obstacles generated pretty similar results to study one findings. Blindfolded horses took longer to walk through the cones and back through the chute, and both demonstrated more avoidance behaviors when doing so. Blindfolded horses also required more lead rope pressure through the cones, while not necessarily backing up. That was pretty comparable. Now, results from the TARP were not drastically different between our two treatment groups, but unblindfolded horses did take a little bit longer, need a bit more lead rope pressure, and have a few more avoidance behaviors than, the blind, than blindfolded horses, but not by much. Now, interestingly, the gate obstacle at the end provided much more trouble for our unblindfolded horses, who required twice the amount of time and lead rope pressure before they were willing to walk through it, and demonstrated four times as many avoidance behaviors when they could see the gate as opposed to their blindfolded counterparts. Now, our results from study one indicate that blindfolded horses could waste precious time in an emergency situation. It takes time to put the blindfold on in the first place, and the blindfolded horses walked slower and resisted far more often than unblindfolded horses, which made handling really difficult for all parties. Another key takeaway here is that our 
inexperienced handlers struggled more in all aspects of the test, regardless of blindfolding status of the horse. She took longer to halter the horse, longer to blindfold the horse, and encountered far more avoidance behaviors when doing so. These findings really highlight the importance of proper training in horse handling for emergency personnel, particularly those who service rural areas. In a barn fire, horses might have just 30 seconds to escape their stall before the blaze takes over. So effective and efficient handling that saves seconds wherever they can is critical and could save lives. Now in study two, our results from the cones and the backing up obstacles were largely comparable to those study one conclusions. Blindfolds slowed down lead time and made handling difficult. However, we did have some interesting findings from the TARP and the gate. Now while the TARP obstacle didn't generate any statistically significant differences between the treatment groups, I did find it interesting that some horses tended to fare better over the tarp when blindfolded, and some fared better without. This likely points to the idea that some horses found the visual trigger of the bright blue tarp on the ground more stressful, but some horses were more stressed out by the auditory trigger of the crinkling of the tarp when they stepped on it that they couldn't place. So that's something to consider in further research, how some horses may be differently affected by different types of triggers depending on their personality. Now, the findings from the pool little gate in study two were much more conclusive than the tarp and appeared to confirm some of the original thought behind the idea of blindfolding horses in the first place. The idea that if you can't see it, it's not scary, they won't spook. Our blindfolded horses went through the gate relatively easily compared to our unblindfolded horses, such as Roland here, who as you can see had some pretty big feelings about this gate. Um, we saw a lot of resistance from these horses and they were very, very frightened of the gate. So, this suggests that in some situations, if time isn't sensitive for you, it's not critical, blindfolding might actually help horses navigate obstacles that they find visually frightening. But it's important to consider horse and handler safety in these scenarios, because if a blindfolded horse gets loose, there's major potential for injury to horse and handler if you have a frightened horse that cannot see where it's running. Now in summary, our data suggests that blindfolds should not be recommended in time-sensitive emergencies such as barn fires because they increase handling time and overall difficulty in a majority of tested scenarios. However, we should note that we didn't simulate a true barn fire environment in our study. If you ran this study again with smoke machines and speakers playing the sound of burning wood, screaming voices, you had people running around the horses, you might find different results, so that would be a great area for future research. <laughs> if anyone wants to go in an arena with horses and do that, feel free. <laughs> but our data does suggest that blindfolds might be helpful to increase tractability if the horse is struggling to cope with frightening visual stimuli and time isn't an issue for you, as long as you're willing to consider the risks that a loose blindfold of horse could cause. And finally, our results highlight how important it is for emergency personnel that service rural areas to receive proper training on horse handling so they can be empowered to respond to emergencies like barn fires. Just before I wrap up here, there are a couple folks I would like to thank. First of all, thank you to Seesaw for having me here today and for the research grant that funded this project. Thank you to Linda Hale, George Daunt, and Tess Needle Daunt at Old Orchard Farm for letting us come to their facility and use their horses. Thank you to Victor McPherson for loaning us your fire suit. And thank you to Jasmine Music for volunteering as our inexperienced handler for study one and for not blinking when we said, hey, do you want to come blindfold horses with us in the dead of winter? That's really the spirit of animal behavior research. <laughs> Finally, thank you to my advisor, Katrina Murphy, who has been uh, so impactful on this project and every other project I have done with her. This project wouldn't have been possible without any of these people, so I would just like to thank you all and thanks for listening.
So making sure you're confident with Paul Trey would be the biggest thing for me. And like I said, to whatever degree it makes them feel they can be brave and confident in that scenario and not worry about it. You know, of course, don't tend to do well with that. <laughs> um, I was just wondering your experience in the, were they just generally experienced forces or were they familiar with those specific forces? So uh, our experience handlers are both from the research team for study one. It was me and I've ridden at this barn for, it was three years at the time, it's five years now. So for me, I was quite familiar with all the horses I've worked with. I've probably ridden them all at least once. Uh, and our experience handler for study two was Kiana McDowell, also from Katrina's lab. And she had not ridden most of them necessarily, but she was familiar with them, had encountered them. She rides at that barn as well. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, so are you worried that maybe that might bias your results? Because even if you're experienced with horses, it is an unknown horse that it still might not be the same type of the horse that you actually know really well. In terms of timing or in terms of how a handler would I suppose so. In my experience, and again, I, I could be biased saying this, it's not something that's been largely studied. Um, I, you know, riding a horse one time doesn't necessarily mean you know them well and you know all of their individual quirks. I pretty much address the horses the same way I would address any others. There would be some factors about not knowing the horses at all, but I think that could also cause safety risks, which is something we were really concerned about with this study because. We're, as research has shown, it reduces their balance and we're putting these blindfolds on them and creating a pretty risky situation for everybody involved. At the very least, because this was a facility we knew, we were able to manage it a little more effectively and know which horses were gonna be safe enough to do this test on, which could present a form of bias for sure, but I think it was the best we could do with the setup that we had. Can I have one more question? Yeah, my question builds on the previous one. Do you think if you repeated this with an experienced handler and had a relationship with the horses, like so that they would maybe trust you, know your confidence, versus an experienced handler that hasn't had any relationship with these horses, would that change the results that you saw, do you think? I think in terms of blindfolding and haltering time, not much because we were more focused on the difference between the inexperienced and the experienced handler and just anecdotally from what we watching the videos and having observed the trials the inexperienced handler wasn't necessarily struggling because the horses didn't trust them or anything like that it was largely you know they had no training they weren't told how to put on a halter uh, they didn't know that you could wrap the hand around the horse's head and bring it down it was more a lack of skill in my opinion which is what we were expecting to see and the interesting part about using riding lesson horses, which is what we did, is studies have actually shown that horses who have multiple handlers within a week are less confident when reacting to novel stimuli. So even if they had a handler that they would had previously, you know, if I rode that horse one time a year ago and they had 60 different people ride them since then, they might be more likely to be a little bit hesitant than a horse who I have an active relationship